Hello and welcome to a new episode of our program, The World Today. I'm Yasmin Bakir and for the next uh, couple of minutes we're going to be shedding more light and diving deep into uh, a further analysis on what is heading uh, the main um, Arab, Egyptian and international newspapers. And we're very much delighted to have... Um, more analysis with the articles in the studio for this afternoon. Um, Ms. Sara Abdelalim, who's a foreign affairs editor at Al Ahram, thank you very much for joining us. And I apologize for my cold. Uh, we start off with Al Ahram online and, of course, Egypt's Al Azhar Grand Imam to meet uh, with French President uh, Francois Hollande in Paris. And um, the Grand Imam arrived on Tuesday in Paris and he is expected to meet with the President of France to discuss the efforts to fight extremism and terrorism. He is uh, going to be attending, or he did attend the second forum of the Eastern and Western uh, Elders where he addressed Europeans and all Muslims around the world, stressing on the importance of dialogue and building trust uh, between religions and cultures. He mentioned how important it is um, to clarify the uh, picture or the image of Islam for the Muslim minorities in European countries to, uh, you know, sort of uh, get along with their societies. And uh, he spoke about um, not to accept uh, uh, Judaizing uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And he spoke about something very important, maybe one of the main reasons why the East and the West are so different is also uh, concluded in the picture or the status of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Very important points that have been mentioned by Grand Imam al-Azhar. How do you read this? Okay, first of all, France uh, is a home of like 5 million Muslims of population of uh, 66 million in France. Um, so I see that the visit is very significant when um, the top Sony clerk visits um, the French president at the, the, the current period. That's very significant because every um, single attack in the world, they return it uh, to extremism, uh, especially to Islam. So uh, it's, it's very important for uh, Dr. Ahmed al Taib to go there to clarify what is Islam and what is the strategy to fight uh, extremism and terrorism. Um, uh, I, I think that Dr. Ahmed al Taib is expected to discuss with the French President uh, Francois Hollande uh, what is the strategy to fight uh, terrorism and what are the uh, steps should be followed in order to um, correct the image of Islam in the European world. Mm. And also he is expected to attend the second uh, forum, the second European forum to uh, meet with the European Muslims to uh, stress with them the importance of uh, the dialogue mm -hmm. and how to build a, a yeah. trust between different religions and cultures in order not to be, uh, in order not to have a gap between uh, uh -huh. Islam and the other uh, religions. Yes. And also this visit is uh, very significant because it followed the um, yesterday uh, visit yes. with the uh, Vatican Pope, yes. uh, Pope Francis. Were they also expected to attend an international conference or to hold mm -hmm. an international conference yes. regarding this. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned something very important. When you, when you speak about how in the past, um, it, you know, the clerics or um, important... Um, religious figures in, in, in the Arab region would travel to the West all the time trying to defend the image of Islam. Mm. But now that terrorism has extended its arms all around the world, mm -hmm. uh, Egypt and other regions, it reached France, Brazil and so forth. So it is now clear that terrorism has no religion. Mm -hmm. And now they need to work together on how they can combat and fight extremism and terrorism. Mm -hmm. This change or this jump into the ideology and to clarify Islamophobia that's been ongoing in the West for years, um, especially youth in the West, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very astonishing because they are not that um, of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They're not aware of what's going on behind their borders. How can that be able to um, wake them up and open their eyes to the bigger picture of what's really happening around the world and pinpointing who are the terrorists? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, there is a focus on uh, the, the Muslim youth also because uh, Daesh or the ISIS uh, group, terrorist yes. group, 
also um, um, address the youth. And they are speaking with the uh, tongue of Islam. So um, I, I don't think that um, they, they don't return it to Islam. I, yes. I, I stress on this. Uh -huh. I, I, I agree and claim that uh, every single terrorist attack in, in the world, they return it to Islam. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I hope... It's going to take time until and a yes. lot of effort... Um, for the truth to reveal, and the yes. truth always is revealed yes. at the end. Um, so let's move to Egypt's independent, um, another, of course, story that is um, of concern of uh, the entire media around the world. Recently, particularly, we're talking here about Egypt's um, Egypt Air Flight 804 uh, that uh, fell into the Mediterranean and the people on board who have lost their lives. Now, Egypt's prosecutor seeks data from France, Greece, uh, regarding the plane crash. Um, Egypt's public prosecutor formally requested data on the crashed Egypt airplane from France and Greece on Monday as the victims remain, uh, remaining begins arriving at Cairo's mortgage ready for the DNA testing. Uh, flight 804 was uh, coming from Paris to Cairo as it vanished off radar screens early Thursday. Um, then uh, it was said that uh, it was lost and unfortunately debris started to appear a couple of days later on board were 56 passengers including 30 egyptians 15 french nationals and uh, 10 crew members were all believed to be dead now um we will not go back again to point one of the story uh, taking in regard the feelings of the families and the relatives of the victims and uh, may god bless their souls may may their souls rest in peace and may God give them patience. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about how you see the cooperation between Egypt, Greece, and France in handling a crisis like this one. Because um, in the middle of all this, we have to admit that there is a systematic, well-trained uh, 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 professionals who are coordinating properly to manage crisis of that sort. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about this? Okay. Um, first of all, the Egyptian officials said that uh, they did not observe uh, the doomed uh, Egypt air flight um, to be uh, swerved before it's uh, planting on the Mediterranean. Um, so that they asked the, the Greece officials and the French official, officials to cooperate. Um, I think that Greece said uh, um, defense minister said that um, the flight um, went astray 90 degrees mm -hmm. and then 30, uh, 360 degrees before planting to the yes, because because the it just entered e Egyptian space by very few miles mm -hmm. uh, right after leaving the Greek space so mm. they logically were most likely to be the ones who would have the mm. information mm -hmm. And, and, and then how do you see the fact that, again, your evaluation to the media coverage of the story? So many rumors have been spread. Mm -hmm. uh, so many conclusions have been jumped. Uh, it's really sad to see how, really you is. know, for the sake of having an exclusive breaking news to be the first channel that would attract ratings, mm -hmm. regardless of how credible mm -hmm. and unhuman mm -hmm. your source could be. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard also one um, one writer in our Egyptian newspapers read, uh, wrote that, um, uh, that the, the plan was taken by the external creatures from the outside atmosphere. <laughs> it was, was he joking or was he serious about it? I think so. <laughs> what, joking? Joking, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I just, anyway, we're not going to get into the story of the media, but um, seriously, seriously, it's, it's in sort of, I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised because you're talking about mm -hmm. a journalist here, but if you go on the other hand to an international mm -hmm. icon channel mm -hmm. that is supposed to be hard news and uh, a credible source, and it goes around saying rumors about the, you know, the, the, the pilot committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people say that it's... I, 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 I mean, they believed it back in 99 when they said Batuti committed suicide, <laughs> but I mean, come on. <gasps> anyway, um, the, on, the, the investigations are still ongoing. The Forensic authorities have denied uh, and, and called a false uh, uh, statements that have been revealed uh, 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 by Reuters saying that 
the result of the remaining of the bodies was due to an explosion. They're still undergoing these forensic tests. They're still undergoing the DNA test to, uh, uh, you know, find and link the bodies to the relatives of the victims. And they're still looking for the two orange boxes. Mind you, they're not black, they're orange boxes. They're still looking for that as well before we jump into further conclusions. Let's move to the Jerusalem Post. Um, Sarah and um, Palestinians reject Netanyahu's call for direct uh, Paris talks. And uh, the article speaks about the French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, and who is on his three days visit to the region, mainly aiming at bringing the two sides, Palestinians and Israelis, together for a conference in the upcoming uh, of the early next month. The peace process is an ongoing conflict that has been going on for years. Many countries and people have tried to sort of bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. um, President Sisi last said that it is only in the benefit of the Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace side by side. How is that going to be ever, as a writer, uh, from your perspective, how is that ever going to be expected to take place? There will never be a two individual state solutions side by side when both are fighting over the major story of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and the borders and the refugees. So what are the, uh, 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 the circumstances or what, under what circumstances is this conference going to be held upon in the first place? Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, the Palestinians always claim that um, the, the, the negotiations with um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is usually fruitless. So why we should repeat the same mistakes? And I, I can see that this is, this is correct. I, I, I follow this perspective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also I know that um, on the 3rd of June there will be um, a meeting uh, and um, representative uh, representatives from 20 countries over, all, all over the world will gather to discuss the, the peace process between the Palestinians and the Israelis, but the only two parties would not attend this meeting will be the Israelis and the Palestinians. So that would not be, <laughs> would not be uh, working. Yes, I, I, just, so. I just don't understand because, um, I mean, you correct me, it's, it's not the first time we've seen the Syria and the Geneva talks. We've also had, uh, uh, I mean, the Mastora in particular had a mm -hmm. lot of struggle putting the opposition and the government parties of Syria together to sort of sit face to face for negotiations. Um, that's why I told you, if they're not going to be attending, under what circumstances will this meeting be held? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be that France is exerting all its efforts trying to support this cause, and I'm sure that it does come with new initiatives. But according to what we've read uh, in the news during the past 24 hours, it's these really sides that are very firm and rigid towards this meeting. They have preservations. Mm -hmm against this meeting and it made an Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made it very clear about mm -hmm. his uh, reservations. So what kind of, um, I don't know, leniency if I may say that France could come up with to try to persuade Israel now to sit back on negotiating table? Um, I think that uh, France should, um, should, should play the role. Uh, of uh, to mediate the, the two uh, points of view and it should uh, persuade the Israeli party to uh, to the negotiations to to um, to, to, to fight uh, yes. the reason why I asked you that Sarah because um, the United States was trying to mediate this uh, mm. peace process for mm. a long time mm. and Kerry failed at several points mm. what can the French do that the United States was not able to achieve? Taking into consideration, I mean, unlike what they propagate on the media about the um, argument or disagreement on certain issues be between the United States and Israel, but let's put it straightforward, they are two, uh, 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 you know, compatible friends, if I may say. Um, so Israel didn't give much uh, attention to what initiatives the United States came up with. Why would the French do um, better? Okay. From, from your personal view? Um, from my opinion. point of view, uh, because usually U.S. will take the side of the Israeli party and will not uh, uh, stand beside the Palestinians. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I hope uh, that the French uh, side would uh, do anything um, to, absolutely. to do. Absolutely, absolutely. We do hope that at first place they could sit face to face because if they're not there, mm -hmm. then I don't know why the meeting is going to be held. In the first place. Finally, uh, let's move to the Gulf news, and um, 
When we speak about the daily headlines, it's unfortunate that we always have to mention about what's going on in Syria. Daesh strikes Syria regime heartland, killing 120. And the terror group says its fighters attacked Alawites gathering in Tartus and Jable. And, um, of course, the images are horrific. It's not the first wave of uh, bombings, by the way, that have been claimed by Daesh. They've been doing it over and over again for the past five years. Um, yet, what's strange here today is that when it comes to fighting back mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and regaining lands or supporting this, uh, uh, what's left of the Syrians in Syria from the terrorist organization like Daesh, and I'm talking about Bashar al-Assad's regime, they say he's not allowed to do that and it's not his right, although he's a legitimate uh, you know, president as far as I remember. <laughs> so um, this play of give me this land and I'm going to you know, uh, take the city and then give me the city whether it happens in Syria and Iraq, I think with my very little uh, minor uh, 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 opinion and experience, it's, it's, not, it's not interesting anymore for people to hear. I don't want to know what land you gain. I want to know when these terrorists are going to leave this mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. from, my, see it? from my point of view, when uh, Bashar al-Assad leaves Syria, uh, I think that would be good for the Syrian people. You believe that if Assad leaves, it's going to be good for the Syrian people. Well, you need to justify that. Um, I can see that uh, the attacks uh, 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 raised by Daesh is, um, is like um, a play role. They they do this because of um, um, they, they they claim that they are fighting the, the opposition parties and um, the, the the Assad regime um, fighting each other. And I see that this is uh, some kind of um, a show. Mm -hmm. I, well, I don't well, believe. Why why isn't the the show relatively similar in Iraq, for instance? I mean, the, the Iraqi government, um, you know, never never did somebody come say, with all the struggles between Haider al abadi and his parliament, mm. and never did somebody come say, well, he's got to leave, or this mm. thing is going to turn into a show. Uh, I mean, it was the Kobani women who forced Daesh out, believe it or not, from well, their area. So uh, why, why, why is the story different and justified in Syria and not justified in, in, in Iraq? And in regard, of course, to the differences of, mm -hmm. of the stories and situations, but it's not justified in Yemen. Mm -hmm. Yemen is a legitimate president, and they want him back mm -hmm. because he's a legitimate president. Well, Bashar al-Assad is a legitimate president as well, mm -hmm. and fighting Daesh has nothing to do with what's going on between the opposition and the, mm -hmm. the pro-government. Uh, this equation is very difficult, I know, in Syria. Mm -hmm. But when, when you've mentioned that the story would end when Bashar leave, do you really... I, I see that he's he really killing his people. This is going to happen. I, I think he is killing his people. Uh, the situation in Iraq, uh, the Iraqi forces yesterday managed to liberate like 11 villages and districts from uh, Daesh. Uh, they recaptured El Fallujah, and this is very significant uh, regarding the, the war against Daesh, because um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a good a grand prize in in the in the war against Daesh. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, the situation in Syria is, is different. I see that Bashar al-Assad is fighting these people. And this is not the situation in Iraq. That's why I am telling you that, uh, that, that all the war in Syria will vanish if Bashar al-Assad leaves. Yes, well, let's hope that this would be the case. And let's hope that it's not going to be all the world's going to collapse if Syria collapses. Um, Thank you very much for your you. fruitful information for uh, joining us. Um, Sarah Abdel Ali was a foreign affairs editor at Al Ahram. She was joining us in today's episode of The World Today. Thank you very much, Thank you. madam. And this brings us to the end of our episode of The World Today. I'm Yasmin Bakir signing off. Thank you very much for watching.